Welcome to the New School. I'm Andrew White. I direct the Center for New York City Affairs here at the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy. The Center is an applied policy research institute that drives innovation in social policy, and we work primarily on issues around public education, child welfare, juvenile justice, child and family services, and so on. Really, our, our work is about the intersection of government and low-income and working-class neighborhoods in New York. Um, we're also home to the Child Welfare Watch Project and to InsideSchools.org. And all of our work, you can find it on the web, CenterNYC.org. And our Twitter feed is at CenterNYC and at Child Welfare NYC. Um, this is uh, an event put together by the Child Welfare Watch Project. It's which is made possible thanks to grants from the Ira W. DeCamp Foundation, the Child Welfare Fund, and the Cyrus Fund. And this morning's program in particular is made possible thanks to the Prospect Hill Foundation. So I want to thank Penny Wilgerote, who is uh, with Prospect Hill, and also the rest of the New York Juvenile Justice Initiative for co-sponsoring today. Um, the Juvenile Justice Initiative is a coalition of philanthropic organizations and donors seeking to improve the youth justice system in New York and outcomes for court-involved youth. And they're funding a lot of the great work that I imagine many of you are doing. So we've gotten great turnout at these juvenile justice events, even when the weather is bad. Um, I feel it's, it's, it's good to know that we've created this kind of cultural space. I hope we can keep it going for a long time to come to talk about um, the issues as they unfold. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit myself to set things up, and then uh, I'm going to introduce Commissioner Carrion to speak about her work and the Administration for Children's Services work on close to home and on juvenile detention. After that, we'll hear a little bit from Chief Joanne Jaffe about her work at the NYPD, and then we'll bring the whole panel up and have a conversation. Um, yesterday morning, Westchester County Executive Rob Astorino gave a talk to Crane's New York business, uh, to a forum that Crane's organized at the New York Athletic Club up on Central Park South, and you may have heard that he's running for governor. Uh, he took a novel approach yesterday. He told the small audience of business people that if they worked with Mayor de Blasio and with other city Democrats, they were just, quote, rewarding leaders who are at best managing the steady decline of New York. Quote, New York City arguably just elected the most anti-business mayor in history, he said. Yet many in the business community jumped on his bandwagon once they thought he might win. I think that's suicidal. Instead of demanding better from elected officials, we settle for scraps in New York. Which is interesting. I, the only reason I bring this up is because of all the time, I mean, I've lived in New York 30 years now, and I've never seen a city that's, not, uh, that's less in steady decline. <laughs> um, and certainly not one where business people are settling for scraps. Uh, I think that's probably news to many of those who are seeing profits beyond anything they've ever had in their lives before. The problems we're struggling with in New York City today are very much different from a city in decline. It's a city with rapidly rising real estate values, with impossibly high rents, with a fast-growing population, and interestingly, more people with jobs in New York than ever before. The number of people working in New York is above any time previously in history. And I'm not saying this to be a rah-rah booster of this sort of new gilded age, what, but really to point out that the problems we're dealing with are the flip side of that explosion of success. Um, so many people in the city are doing so well at the high end that we have to figure out how to capture some of that for the people on the margins. And those margins are not really that marginal. The, a good report came out yesterday from the Center for Economic Opportunity. It was presented to the council. It talks yet again about the scope of poverty in New York. And of course, poverty in New York remains very high. If you use the city's definition of poverty, it's about 26% of the population living at or near the poverty line, or 46% near the poverty line, at or near the poverty line, 26% at the poverty line. So just over a year ago, we published a report, and we held a forum about neighborhoods, youth, and the justice system in New York. That report was out there on the table when you came in. 
That was the final year of the Bloomberg administration. And at that time, at that time we had no idea who was going to be mayor and what was going to happen to the reforms that had begun well before that. Some of the innovative criminal justice officials from the prior administration remain with Mayor de Blasio in new positions, including one of our panelists today, Chief Joanne Jaffe of the NYPD. Some others in this field have joined us from the state, including Commissioner Carrion of ACS and some of her deputies, including Felipe Franco, who's running the ACS Division of Youth and Family Justice. And in other words, on many of the issues that we write about and that you care about, there's some element of consistency from one administration to the next and an opportunity to push further or in new directions. So we're going to explore two key areas today, two overlapping realms. One is the relationship between young people and our police department. I'm talking primarily about young people in black and Latino neighborhoods and most especially working class communities like those in public housing. The loss of trust between the police and young people boiled up into a major campaign issue last year. And there were important changes under Mayor Bloomberg. Trespass arrests declined sharply over the last few years. Stop and frisks declined. And following reports that marijuana possession arrests accounted for nearly one-fourth of all misdemeanor arrests in 2012, the mayor announced a year ago that the city would no longer detain people overnight if they were caught with small amounts of marijuana. So one of the things we can talk about today is how has all of that re been reflected on the ground or is it being seen on the ground where people live? More recently, Commissioner Bratton has promised to change the practice of flooding some neighborhoods with cadets straight out of the, out of the academy. Um, are these changes noticeable and what's next? So we'll talk about can the, can the NYPD find new ways to institutionalize collaboration with residents particularly in neighborhoods uh, like public housing, and with young people who for some time have said they felt unfairly targeted. Along similar, similar lines, we'll look at the transformation of the city's juvenile justice system over the last several, several years and try to understand how these changes are gaining traction and how they can be pushed further. The city is putting far fewer children in detention facilities than in the past, and this has been happening over several years. Can that number be reduced even further? New York is sending very few children to upstate facilities, instead diverting many young people into alternative programs overseen by the probation department and placing others into residential programs here in the city close to home. So what's next with all that? We're going to start this morning, as I said, from, with comments from our two city officials on the panel and their key leaders in both of these areas. We'll bring the panel up and at some point we want to hear from some of you in the audience. Uh, and I um, was hoping to have a group of young people here. We've heard sort of several of them have, have called in this morning to say they're not making it, but we got some other folks here. We're gonna get you, get the mic to you. <coughs> Gladys Carrion became commissioner of ACS just four months ago, less than four months ago. She was previously commissioner of the Office of Children and Family Services for New York State, serving under governors Spitzer, Patterson, and Cuomo. She's a former executive director of Inwood House, and I've worked with her for many years. Uh, she's been, previously was on the advisory board of Child Welfare Watch almost from its founding. Gladys. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces. So I am now in the city. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> So as many of you know, uh, working to transform the juvenile justice system in the state of New York was a priority of mine as the state commissioner and will continue to be a priority at now that I am serving in the city and part of the de Blasio administration. And I am thrilled to be in the city in part because I don't have to do that weekly commute to Albany. Uh, so that was a real plus. So an effective juvenile system is one that empowers families and communities to take care of their youth by providing support and services and connecting them to pro-social uh, adults and activities. And I don't think I need to say that to anybody in this crowd. Uh, that's the work that I started in the state and that's the work that I will continue in partnership with Felipe Franco who's here today who has followed me to the city of New York and I'm really very happy about that. 
I couldn't do uh, this work without having a really talented and committed team. So we know that when children engage in inappropriate, you know, antisocial behavior, whatever we want to call it, whatever upsets the adults, um, we will try very hard uh, in New York City not to incarcerate them, uh, but to engage them in services in their communities. And in some occasions, I think we all have to acknowledge that we will have to um, provide uh, some placement um, for young people that do commit acts that cause harm to the greater society or to themselves. And they will need uh, the structure and predictability and the services and supports that out-of-home placement will provide. But we think and we know and we see that that number will continue to get smaller and smaller if we do the work that we need to do in communities. So we are committed to working to build a better continuum from pre-adjudication to placement. We spent a lot of time looking at the role of detention, and that's, we spent, I will tell you that Felipe Franco's first days on the job was uh, at our detention facilities. Um, we spent a lot of time uh, already in our 124 days, but I I'm not counting, uh, to determine uh, how to make it better uh, and safer, as well as how to use it as a first step to understand and address the needs of young people. And so we, you sh we definitely need to use every single moment that we have with these young people, uh, not to merely house them in a detention facility, uh, but to really get to know, day one, what they're all about. Ultimately, we want detention to reflect what the juvenile justice system is truly about, care, support, and high expectations for our young people. We can't view, continue to view detention merely as a holding place. Every day that we have a young person in detention or placement is an opportunity to do better and we can't afford to waste that time. We're committed uh, to providing preventive services for youth in crisis. Out of home juvenile justice placement is and should be our last option. I remain committed to build upon my statewide efforts to work with judges and others, my partners in the city probation uh, in particular, to further reduce the unnecessary use of juvenile detention. While we've seen a marked decrease in the use of detention, many young people continue to be in detention for just a few days. So it's clear that these young people are not a risk to the community. So why do I have them? So we're gonna find out. Uh, and we're gonna do something about that. Um, ACS oversees two community-based alternative programs that offer young people involved in or at risk of involvement in the juvenile justice system the opportunity to receive services at home. The Family Assessment Program, FAP, identifies services and provides referrals to families to work through their challenges before the need for court involvement arises. In 2013, this program was able to serve 6,700 families. I bring that up because we have to work with families. We need to make sure that we have the services and supports that families need in, or, in order for them to be able to effectively nurture their children and keep their children safe. JJI, which is the Juvenile Justice Initiative, links young people and families with intensive therapeutic interventions aimed at diverting youth from residential placement. JJI seeks to reduce recidivism, improve youth and family functioning, and reduce the number of delinquent youth in residential facilities, and has the capacity to serve 280 young people each year. And I'm happy to report that the New York State Division of, Commu of Criminal Justice Services awarded ACS a contract uh, with, along with New York Fowling and the Center for Court Innovation, which will expand our capacity, enable us to provide alternatives to detention services to youth in Queens. In total, <coughs> through partnerships with the New York City Probation, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we have leveraged city tax levy dollars, federal, state, and private foundation dollars to invest close to $37 million in diversion programs in New York City. Adding our investments 
to those in DYCD programs like the Beacon and Summer Youth Employment Programs, ACS's Child Welfare Preventive Dollars that fund services for our most vulnerable youth and families, and the ATDs administered by the New York City Office of the Criminal Justice Director, supported, support by the city for programs designed to keep youth out of, juvenile, out of the juvenile justice system is substantial. And we need to look at all of those programs that are available and the interplay in our communities and how we leverage and make sure that they're working in a really coordinated, integrated fashion to make sure that we are creating that fabric of services in the communities with the highest needs. $37 million is a lot of money. I'd like more, but it's a lot of money. Um, you know, our detention data is better than ever and we have significantly reduced incidents and use of restraints. Now I will tell you that's very ironic. You know, while I was at the state, we put the city detention under corrective action plan, so now I get to supervise my own plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so incidents have declined from a rate of 33.8% in February of 2013 to 20.1% in February of 2014, and we will do better. The rate of physical restraint used in secure detention is down from 71.8% in February of 2013 to 34.2% in February of 2014. Similarly, the, fate, the rate of mechanical restraint use decreased from 49.4% in February 2013 to 34.5% in February of this year. And I raise that because all of us have been very, very concerned about the use, the violence and the use of restraints in our system. So it's something that we are watching very closely and something that we're working at. So although we want detention to be safe, and that's really important, we also want to create an environment that's rich with intellectual, emotional, and physical activities for our young people. Toward that end, we've established weekly programming meetings at each secure detention facility to plan for special events and activities for youth. We can't forget that they're adolescents and that developmental stage and what they need. We've partnered with Bellevue Hospital as part of a SAMHSA grant to bring trauma-informed care and skill workshops to youth in secure detention. As you know, you probably saw a recent report that 50, at least 50% 50 of the youth at Rikers have experienced trauma. Um, so trauma is a big issue for the young people that are in our systems. We've increased family engagement in youth programs. We will continue to do better. Families have to be part of the equation. We've brought scores of outside providers into detention. And that's something that you know we've, we've been doing for a while. We've really enhanced that. We have Carnegie Hall, Voices, Voices Unbroken. We have Montefiore Hospital. We have Bronx Writers, New York Cares, Doing Art Together, Gems, Shakespeare in the Park. We've held several community partnership events for parents and youths inside secure detention. We've conducted summer youth employment programs at each of the secure detention program facilities. Really, really important work. Now, close to home. 18 months ago, the city and state launched Close to Home, which gave, as you know, ACS custody of New York City's young people adjudicated as juvenile delinquents. And I participated, and some claim that I was the architect. I'm not so sure. Um, the city launched the first phase of Close to Home, a non-secure placement in September of 2012. Since then, nearly 300 young people have successfully completed their court orders, which ACS divides into two components, residential care and aftercare. Approximately 200 youth are currently in residential care and 85 are in aftercare status. This change in practice of keeping troubled children in the community is new and it will take some time to educate youth, families, providers, and communities to take full advantage of this opportunity. We're still learning how to keep youth focused on their goals and addressing their needs and their family needs. The non-secure placement system is now stable and allowing us to progress to phase two limited secure. 
The number of youth absent without leave that are AWOL has decreased significantly since the inception of the program. As of March 2014, the overall AWOL rate was 11%. And as you know, there was a point in time that it was close to 50% AWOL rate. So this is you know, a substantial improvement. And we really attribute this rate to the fact that providers are discovering how to truly engage youth. And we continue to work with providers very closely to increase programming for close to home youth. Good Shepherd recently programmed with Carnegie Hall to introduce a song writing program to a group of non-secure placement boys. The boys, along with Carnegie Hall musicians, put on an amazing performance for their families, staff, and friends. In addition to programming, we're revamping all the specialized beds in non-secure placement with a focus on building skills on youth, in youth and families through dialectic behavioral therapy. So we're doing really work to really strengthen uh, close to home programs. I will deviate a little bit from script and talk about the system. It's my opinion um, that you know, the implementation of close to home, we had lots and lots of challenges, and I think we could, we could acknowledge that. Uh, we're working really hard, and I think we've made a lot of progress in a very short time to stabilize the program, to identify what the challenge is, what the strengths are, and really build on that and work closely with providers. I really feel strongly that what the city did, and I understand the challenges and certainly was part of that, and worked really hard with the city to help them implement close to home, it was a very, very aggressive timeline. Um, and so there were challenges as a result. And I think that what the city did initially to implement the program was really not work to build a system, a juvenile justice system in partnership with the other players, but it let out a series of contracts. And so what we're gonna be doing now and working really hard is to develop a system, a juvenile justice system in the city of New York, that we articulate what our vision is and what our values are, and that that informs the work, that we identify interventions that work and a model, and that we do that in partnership certainly with the providers, that we develop the capacity to meet the needs of all of the young people that come as few as those may be. And I think that's really important. And that's what you uh, need to make sure that uh, we do at ACS. Uh, there's still a lot of work ahead of us to really have uh, the premier system in this country. As, we, as you know, I have delayed the implementation of phase two of the limited secure, the implementation of the limited secure system. I did that because we weren't ready. We weren't ready. And the state um, has been wonderful partners in allowing us to delay the implementation. So there should be some lessons learned for the challenges that we experienced in implementing phase one. And I see some of my former staff here nodding their heads. It was a very challenging period as we tried really, really hard to develop close to home, cognizant of the fact that we had children and young people that we had to take care of. And that if we did this wrong, if, you know, missteps, it was the young people that were going to suffer. And so we were very mindful of that. So we've learned some lessons and we've slowed it down as a result. And so we, ne we need to make sure that we have the capacity that we need. We have to make sure that the agencies have developed the cap capacity that they need, that they've identified a model, that they've hired the right staff, that they've trained, that we worked with our core partners, that we have the supports we need in communities, that we've engaged all our partners in conversation about what it is that we're doing, how we want to do it, and how we can do this better. And so that work is before us. We, we've started, we have not submitted a final plan to the state for their approval, which would be the next step. Um, once we have a plan ready, uh, which we're working on, that will be published, and I'm sure we will have many, many comments. So I just wanted to give you an update as to where we are. So aftercare, we need to continue to create continuity and connect youth to the many assets in our communities. We're restructuring case, case management to create a seamless process from intake to aftercare 
We plan to make youth and their families the center of our practice to ensure that their voice is heard. Nothing about us without us. We're building a community grounded approach, understanding that our communities are the city's best assets. We're planning to move our work to the neighborhoods in partnership with neighborhood based organizations. It's a tall order, a lot of difficult work in front of us. And in order to do, do this, we need to partner with everyone in this room to make this happen. We can't do this by ourselves. So I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew, for always making these forums available for us. All right. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Our next speaker is uh, Chief Joanne Jaffe, who ha became Chief of the Community Affairs Bureau at the NYPD in February. She had been Chief of the Housing Bureau for some time before that, and she has been the highest ranking woman officer in the NYPD for 11 years now. Chief Jaffe. Good morning, everyone. So I'm just going to start by putting things in the police department in context, just to give you some understanding. Um, first, in terms of the organizational structure, there are about 10 three-star chiefs. And we're bureau chiefs. Um, so I was the bureau chief for 10 and a half years of the Housing Bureau in 1995. Both housing and transit were merged. They were separate police departments, and they were merged into the New York City Police Department as one. So you have 10 bureaus now. So, for example, there's OCCB, which is like our narcotics division, organized crime. There's internal affairs. There's patrol services that oversees all the precincts. There's a transit bureau and a housing bureau. Those are like five. So there's 10 three-star chiefs, one four-star chief who's chief of the Department, and then the first deputy commissioner and the police commissioner. So that's like overall just learning the structure of the police department. Um, for 10 and a half years, I've uh, been the chief of the Housing Bureau, and I was just move over under Commissioner Bratton, who made a lot of changes in the police department, to the chief of the Community Affairs Bureau. But what I'm going to talk to you about today mostly is really my work in the Housing Bureau, but I will talk about um, what my visions are and the direction we're going in in terms of our uh, community engagement work. And I want to also put crime and issues in the housing developments in the city in the context of how we in the police department look at them and to give you an understanding of what we do and our initiatives and strategies. So in public housing, you have um, this 334 developments of public housing in the city and any one development could be two buildings or it could be like 40 buildings. There are some very large public housing developments like Queensbridge in the 114, um, Red Hook in the 76 precinct, sorry I talk in precinct numbers. Um, and then there are areas that are clusters of housing developments. So the South Bronx, East Harlem, and Brownsville has clusters of like 30,000 people living in housing developments for like you know less than a square mile and huge buildings 18 story 13 story could be like 50 or 60 buildings various development names um, and usually those housing developments where their clusters are where most of our uh, the majority of uh, the violent crime and the, the high crime areas are. When you look at the city's crime, regardless of the number, and we've had reductions in crime, as you know, year after year, when you look at the city's crime, in general, the city's crime is two-thirds property and one-third against the person. So that's a general number, but proportionally, that's how it is year after year. When you look at public housing and crime in public housing, it's the exact opposite. It's two-thirds against the person, year after year, regardless of the number of crimes, and one-third property. And you can see why that makes sense, because in public housing, you don't have the burglaries, right? You don't have the stolen cars, and you don't have like the grand larcenies, which are the property crimes that plague other parts of the city but you have a much higher proportion of violent crime. So again, taking the next layer of the onion, peeling it the next layer, in, uh, in all the crime in the city, we are three, Housing Bureau consists of all the housing developments, crime in the housing developments, 3.5% of the city's crime, 5.5% of the city's population, 
and 20% of the city shootings, 18% of the murders, 15% of the robberies, but 20% of the shooting incidents is tremendous, and that is year after year, regardless of, you know, it's 18, 19, 20%, but usually about 20%. And really what that speaks to is too many guns in public housing, right? A lot of the violent crime, the crews, the gangs, and what we need to do and how we need to police. But that becomes one of the big dilemmas in policing, right? So, um, those are basically the crime overall facts of policing public housing. Um, in public housing, there's a little less than 2,000 cops in the city that work primarily in public housing, but that's not to say all the other bureaus, the Narcotics Bureau, they're all assets that and resources that come into public housing. We have a large elderly population. We have a large, you know, young young youngster, I was gonna say young juvenile, but young youth population in public housing. A lot of um, families that are uh, different generations living together and a lot of families that are young kids being raised by grandma, great grandma with other, no other adults in the household. NYCHA says is about 400, 420,000 uh, people that live in public house, housing authorized tenants, and we both agree, both us and, the, and NYCHA, that there's about another 200,000 that live in public housing, more of a transient population. So we usually say about 600, 625,000 people that live in public housing throughout the city in New York. Um, we have a tremendous amount of initiatives, what we've worked on in the past 10 years, but one specifically that has to do with juvenile crime is, I believe, really why I'm here today, to talk about um, our JRIP program. And the JRIP program, JRIP stands for Juvenile Robbery Intervention Program. And I'll just, again, just to put it in context, instead of just to talk about, tell you what I was struggling with in 2006 into 2007 and uh, how it came about. We, we're t I'm talking about Brownsville, and we have an impact zone in the 73 precinct. Those three areas are impact zones. Impact zones are basically where the recruits from the police academy, Andrew called them cadets, but cadets is something else. So the recruits, when they come out of the police academy, traditionally twice a year, they get sent to impact zones throughout the city. There are impact zones in housing. There are four of them. There are impact zones in transit, where there's high crime in transit, and of course in precincts throughout the city. And they're looked upon either commercial districts, but higher crime areas. Could be property crime, could be violent crime, for a person crime. For me, in housing, it was always against the person. Um, and we put our cops there for like the first six months to the year, their year. And it's training for them, but it's also where they go in these high crime areas to police um, those areas. So for us, it was uh, Brownsville, East Harlem. It it's also Bed-Stuy and uh, the South Bronx. So in Brownsville, we had an impact zone there since about 2004. And it consisted of uh, Van Dyke, Seth Lowe, Langston Hughes, Tilden, and... Van Dyke, I thought I said Van Dyke. So those five developments in that, that close area. And in the end of 2006, we were really struggling with robberies and the amount of robberies. And we were struggling at, I'm, I'm talking about like October, November, December, the robberies were going up. People were getting robbed, older people were getting robbed, young kids were getting robbed. And statistically, we compare our numbers year after year in the same time period, in the same areas. That's how the police department looks at crime, year after year. And we compare it to the year prior and the year prior. And as they were increasing, I was changing tactics with my impact zone, changing hours, changing deployment, adding more cops, the traditional ways that we address like when crime spikes for, for a while. And in this period of time, over these months, it would work for like a week or two, like the crime would kind of come down a bit, it would ebb and flow, but then all of a sudden, it would, it would resurrect, it would happen again, it would just percolate. And it was like we weren't getting a good grasp on it. And one of the things I saw that it was a lot of youth on youth crime. So it was a lot of the juveniles during this increase that were committing the robberies as described by the complainants. And because I was frustrated and somewhat frustrated with myself, um, I just touched something. Um, I said, let me think about this a different way. Let me think about not only where crime happens, because that's so much of how the police department looks at their crime analysis, where crime happens, and we map it out, and we deploy based on where crime happens. But who are the people that are committing the robberies in this area, in Brownsville, this whole area? Who are those juveniles? 
who've been arrested in the city for robbery, but who lives here? So it's looking at crime in a different way. It's based on where you live rather than uh, where crime occurs. So we did a run in the city, and you go to like one of the computer units, and you do a real time run. And we said, OK, this was the criteria I picked. And I just did this because I could have picked anything. 17 years of age and under. I could have picked 18. I could have picked 19. Who, who has been arrested for robbery in the past year anywhere in the city. So it didn't matter to me if this, if this kid, Johnny Jones, was arrested in the Bronx, but who lives in these developments in the 7th or in this closed contained area, which was less than one square mile? And we came up with like hundreds of names, and it was the 7th or precinct in the precinct and in those housing developments within. And then we vetted through them, and we came up with 106 kids. So again, 17 years of age and under, arrested for a robbery, not convicted, one year prior, a minimum of one arrest, and lived in this area. So that was part one of the program. Part, part two was, so that was going to be like, who are our kids that are committing these robberies? Right? They might have done one, but they might have done five. And we had some kids there that were on 17 that did do five, that were arrested for five robberies. In my head, if you were arrested for five robberies, arrested for five, you did about 30 or 40 at a minimum. Um, and I think most people in the police department you know, would agree with that because as many times people do robberies and don't get arrested. The second part was we're going to put together a task force and the task force in this area was going to consist of a leader, right, the commander of it, detectives from the squads, intel people from the intelligence division, transit cops, housing cops, precinct cops, and school safety division. And we were gonna start taking a look at these kids and looking at their families and looking at what's going on in their lives because we wanna offer these kids options. They're ready, they've already been arrested, minimum of one time, but some of them many times and some of them for many other things. And we wanted to work with them and their families to see if we could help them change their lives. And we were going to give them choices. And if you've ever heard of David Kennedy, the, uh, I like to call him the famous criminologist, this was somewhat mirrored after his program, which dealt with gangs in, uh, in Boston at that time. And now he's, he's been all over, um, really, the country. Uh, but it had to do with older people, had to do with gangs and gang violence. So I'm just looking for one sheet. So the next step was we were going to bring together our law enforcement partners. And our law enforcement partners were probation. It was the DA's office, the Brooklyn DA's office. It was corp counsel that was prosecuting cases against uh, the juveniles. And probably um, family court and some of the judges. And we're going to bring them together and say, we're going to have this group of kids. And in the beginning, we had 106 kids. Now there's about 700 kids that went through the JRA program. And we said, we need you to be our partners, law enforcement partners, in this program. And what the program's going to do is, we're going to go into these homes, and we're going to, we're going to talk to these kids, and we're going to talk to their families. And we're going to give them tremendous options and resources to help them change their lives. But there's going to be a deal here. And the deal here is telling the kid and his or her family that the violent crime has got to stop. It's got to stop. It's unacceptable. And if you continue to engage in violent conduct and criminal conduct, we are not only going to arrest you, we're going to do everything we can with our law enforcement partners to make sure you go to jail and to stay in jail, even if your friends don't go to jail and they get off, because you are going to be provided with a tremendous amount of options. So basically, those were the steps to kind of pull this together. So we started looking at our kids. We created like folders on all our kids. We looked at who they've been arrested with, who they hang out with. And if you understand life and housing developments, like Van Dyke hates Glenmore. And these are all gangs based on, and gangs and crews based on not only what development you live in, but if you're in the front of a development, Element in the back of the development, you get crews and, and, and names of crews, and they shoot each other. They shoot each other if you walk across the street. This is life in public housing. And this goes on throughout the city. This is, they grow up and they just, they just, it's like anyone that went to high school, there's cliques, or junior high school that went to cliques, this is really based on where you live. And it's a survival tactic, A, and it's also, it's entrenched in, in development life. And there's graffiti all over, and then you X out the graffiti saying you're walking on somebody's turf, and then there's a shooting because it's retaliation. 
So what we did is we started putting together profile packages on all our kids and then starting to knock on doors. And starting to knock on doors and introduce ourselves, which was very interesting um, in the beginning, because usually the doors would slam in our face and say, like, F you, you're not coming into our house. But Mrs. Jones, we want to talk to you and we want to help you about Johnny Jones. Get the F out of here, right? So it, it really took time. It took time to build up trust, to build up a relationship, to let people see that what we were about was about caring for your kid and wanting to provide opportunity, resources, options, and a different way of life for these kids. We want to get you back in school. We want to help you with your GED. We want to get you back in, we want to get you to go to college. We do college applications with kids. We have paid for kids to take buses to college for interviews. We've paid for kids to stay at a hotel. We want to help mama with health problems, mental health problems, medical problems. We have taken mama and grandma to doctors and dentists, which the police department, the cops aren't even really allowed to do that because they're not supposed to have people like in radio cars. Um, we will help with education. We will help with the other little kids in the family. We will help you know, identify what some of the issues are. We will start, we started basketball league. We started playing ball with them. We also got um, in Brownsville, uh, LaGuardia, started sending over one of those big, huge, like teaching lab vans, buses and uh, started going there Wednesdays. And it was a computer lab outside of the precinct, which in housing is a PSA. So it was PSA 2 on Sutter Avenue. And we started, it was a computer lab, and we started teaching our kids and doing reading and writing and uh, computer skills with our kids in the, in the bus, in the lab, which is now turned into a learning lab in Brownsville that if you're interested in, that just started this past year, that is all for our JRIP kids, JRIP families, and kids in Brownsville. Again, help with skills and resources. We have had tremendous, tremendous success. Now, A, it's about the people, obviously, the cops, the detectives, the leadership that, um, that has been pulled together in that Brownsville area. It was so successful when we look at recidivism amongst these kids and, and how we have helped them transform their lives and their families' lives. We've expanded it to um, East Harlem, and we did that in 2009, and we've had some of the same successes. So there's a lot of statistics. I'm getting the three-minute uh, mark. There's a lot of successes that we've had. Um, we work very, very closely with the kids, with their families. We've developed some wonderful relationships with them. Uh, the New York Times wrote about us like a year ago. PSB just did a story on us um, about two months ago. And they interviewed some of the JRIP kids. So this isn't about us. It's also about our kids. Our kids that have been arrested for robbery, that talk about the robberies that they did, that talk about why they were doing them. And all of us understand what it's like to be a teenager. I think uh, the commissioner before said something about development, and I like to say about all kids, you know, they don't grow brains, kids. They used to grow brains when they're 21, now it's like they're 25, and that's just in general. So, you know, when a kid's 15 and 16, they make some stupid decisions, and it doesn't mean they're a bad person, and it doesn't mean they're an evil person. And we have to do what we can as one agency to also reach out to these kids and do everything we can one by one to get them back on track. And we see we can make such a difference that these kids don't have to continue a life of crime, that we could have a tremendous, tremendous positive impact on our lives. So now moving over, and I'll just talk for one minute. So now I'm in the Community Affairs Bureau. And coincidentally, in Community Affairs Bureau, I have a whole juvenile justice section. Um, I also oversee all the school safety uh, offices that are throughout the schools in the city, which is about, um, 6,000, and then we have our whole community uh, affairs bureau, which all has to do with community outreach and crime prevention for the city of New York. Um, looking right now very closely at how we could expand the philosophy of JRIP into the whole city, into what we do. Now, mind you, 700 kids have, about 700 kids have gone through JRIP. We do them in phases where we do a new computer run, see what kids are arrested, live in these areas. We do that, you know, frequently, and then we monitor 
if they've been arrested, um, why they're in the program, and how many times they've been arrested for robbery before the program. And that's how we really determine if we're successful or not successful. Um, how to expand this, but maybe n not with such intense resources. Because you have to understand, in the two JRIPs we have, there's a tremendous amount of police, I mean, to have like 13 or 14 detectives and sergeants and lieutenants in one small unit dealing with at any given time about 150 kids is a lot of resources a lot of resources so you just can't say well let's replicate this all over the city but there's ways that we can replicate this philosophy but that goes into like now the philosophy of the department and and how it's really changing under the leadership of the mayor and commissioner bratton and i uh, i think it's it's everything you've read you hear um uh, the city is changing, and it's a time to re-engage, reset, and really take a fresh look at our relationships. I think the police had a, a decent relationship in public housing. We worked very closely with the leadership of public housing uh, community residents, besides NYCHA. And the leadership helped us go in and police, but we obviously need to do more as the police department. We need to make sure the community is with us in everything we do. So for example, in our impact zones, when I talk about them, we need to engage communities more. We know that for many people, many young people, an impact zone looks like an armed police camp coming in when it's really, to us, not about that, but the perception is like that. So how do we address that? How do we deal with that? And these are some of the fresh things that we're looking at because we're gonna make it better when the next class comes out. We're gonna do some more field training. Commissioner Bratton's gonna get away from sending younger people, the newer people in, and we're gonna have a better field training program. And we're gonna make sure our cops are much more engaged with the community and the community with them, because it goes two ways, before they even come out. And we're going to announce ourselves and not come in like an arm camp, which the perception is in many ways. So there's a lot of things we're working on in the police department. I think it's a very, very exciting time um, under Commissioner Brandt. I worked for him in, uh, in the 90s also. And uh, it's, it's very exciting to be in the police department right now. It's just like a new era. Um, I'm going to sit down because I think the next person is going to speak. But I also have some of my uh, representatives here from JRIP and uh, the police department. So uh, they're here too to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, so why doesn't the rest of the panel come on up and Commissioner carry on as well? Thank you, Chief Jeff. So we got a lot on the table here. Um, I want to ask one quick question to follow up on what we just heard. Um, to what degree are you able to see an impact in the number of crimes in the communities, in the public housing neighborhoods where you're doing JRIP? Is there a real clear um, correlation with reduced violence yet? There is. Um, is this on? So I'll give you an example. If you look at proportionally um, the number of robberies in the city since 2009 and the number of robbery arrests, so we look at robbery, I mean, this is what it looks like as a chart. So it's just proportional. I know you can't see the numbers. But year after year, um, it's about 40% of people arrested for robbery in the city since 2009. 40% are 17 years of age and under. 2010, it was 41%. But then in 2011, it went to 37%, 2012, 33%, and 2013, 31%. That's a phenomenal statistic. I mean, in my eyes, it is. It's looking at the proportion of kids in general arrested for robberies based on the number of robberies. And then the other most significant, um, again, this is like numbers in the aggregate. We have 658 if you add up all the phases of JRIP and the two JRIPs, this is as of the end of 2013, 658 kids have come through JRIP. And if you look at all their one year prior 
before they were ever in JREP, they were arrested for 763 robberies one year prior. So all together the phases added together in the aggregate. One year after the program, uh, 63 kids were arrested for 77 robberies. Two years after the program, 48 kids were arrested for 59 robberies. And three years, 25 kids were arrested for 31 robberies. Right. That is phenomenal. So we have graphs that show all this. And then we also look at just robberies in those areas. Now robberies in those areas, we know the kids, a lot of the kids were arrested for robberies, not necessarily in their two areas in Brownsville and East Harlem. Their arrests had to do with like school robberies and train robberies, et cetera. But we also look at those areas robberies and those areas will also show decreases over the years. Right. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see over the years if this has an impact on their si younger siblings and community I would them. we actually put in a grant mm -hmm. I wanted that more than anything to to look at the kids over 10 years and also look at the effect on the siblings I mean the five-year-olds and six-year-olds that were in their households and we developed such a wonderful relationship and now at eight years old we're bringing them into basketball leagues and doing so many different things with them and really see over a time period but we didn't get the state right. grant all right maybe next time <laughs> all right so I'm gonna introduce the other three panelists Gabrielle Horowitz Prisco is uh, at the Correctional Association, has been there four years and directs the Juvenile Justice Project there and organizes a youth coalition called the Juvenile Justice Coalition for advocacy work. Next to her is uh, Chino Hardin, who is the project coordinator for the ARCHES program and a field trainer and organizer with the Center for New Leadership on Urban Solutions, which used to be at Medgar Evers and is now an independent advocacy think tank. And next to him is Chris Watler, who is project director of the Harlem Community Justice Center, which is a community court developed by the Center for Court Innovation and works on housing, youth justice, and parolee reentry, among other things. And the um, Harlem Justice Corps is one of, one of the projects he's working on, which I think we want to go right to now. I guess, Chris, you've been working at the Justice Center for a while now. And I'm wondering, to what degree have you seen changes emerging over the last few years in terms of the young people you're working with and their relationship with the police on the one hand and with the juvenile justice system on the other? Yeah, uh, thank you, Andrea. And I want a uh, real pleasure to be here on such a great uh, uh, panel. Um, so Har Harlem's kind of interesting, right? It's this kind of iconic community. Anywhere you go in the world, if you say Harlem, outside of uh, Amsterdam, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll think of New York City. Um, and it's a community of contradictions, right? There's, there's tremendous uh, wealth and gentrification going on right next to uh, tremendous poverty. And so I started at the Harlem Project in 2007. And at the time, and so there's an interesting story here about success and about failure. Uh, at the time, we were running a juvenile reentry program with OCFS that actually was quite successful. 71% uh, of our kids in that program were rest free a year and a half uh, after they left. And that was a real testament to collaboration on the back end uh, with young people and their families. So the, the parents and caregivers were coming in with the kids to report and the whole team was focused on helping those young people, including the OCFS uh, aftercare counselors, helping them to get jobs, to get connected to what they needed to, and working with them, quite frankly, on their thinking, you know, really challenging some of the ideas in their head about you know, what was right, what wasn't right. Hmm. Um, and by 2009, we actually went back to the Robin Hood Foundation and said, look, you know, we're not gonna take your money for this anymore, because the numbers had declined across the state of young people coming out. So even though we had been successful with the program, essentially the pool of eligible youth had, had dried up. And that was uh, unfortunate that we you know, said we, were, you know, we weren't gonna get that money anymore, but essentially my staff and I sat around and said, wow, this is a real sign of success yeah. for the city and for this community. Um, however, <laughs> we also recognized that what was going on in the community were tremendous amounts of violence, usually, as you heard earlier, uh, by young people against other young people uh, in the community. 
And I thought Chief Jaffe's uh, statistic, particularly about uh, NYCHA, is, is important because in Harlem, we have about 45 public housing developments uh, in the community. But what we saw working with the police, partners in government, partners in the community, especially including NYCHA, uh, is that the majority of the violence against people was actually concentrated in 10 developments. Uh, in the community. So two-thirds of the shootings and kind of violent crime were really, it, it wasn't all 45, it, it was 10. Um, so I, I kind of looked at those 10 and, and was really wondering what, you know, what's going on uh, here? You know, what could we be doing? And so that led us to form our gang task force and we, you know, have some recommendations and, you know, did that work. So from a kind of you know, maybe a higher level, seeing that there were real, there's real progress being made in the community on violence, but also seeing the disparities and that some young people were essentially living in the 1970s New York I grew up in, right. you know, where it just seemed like if you wanted to protect yourself, it was up to you, that your community wasn't going to protect you, your parents weren't going to protect you, and quite frankly, the police weren't going to uh, protect you. And so that that divide between police, the justice system, and young people, I think we have an opportunity now to really uh, to, to work on. Because quite frankly, we have failed. We have failed those young people and those uh, communities uh, who have experienced violence. Every time I talk to a mom who's lost a kid uh, to violence, or to a young person who's lost a friend, there's a, there's a real sense of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, I think we have to change that uh, in this city. So I'm, I'm really right. pleased to hear the chief talk and, and Gladys talk about what, you know, what their organization is doing. But I also want to give some credit to the activists and organizers who for years in these communities, hey, I've grown up in this city, uh, have been laboring away on these issues and now recently seem to be getting some traction, which is really kind of exciting. Right, all right. Gabrielle, uh, one of the things they talked about at the city council hearing yesterday uh, for where they brought up the Center for an Economic Opportunity report was that this administration is going to try to bring things to scale, whereas the last administration was piloting projects and doing relatively small innovations, but really trying to ramp all of this up and have a broader impact. You're focused pretty heavily on detention and on close to home. I mean, do you see opportunities for scale there? And how do you, th sort of where do you see where we've come as far as how it can shape what goes forward? Sure, thanks. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. So first of all, I wanna say as a sort of framing remark, and it was really powerful to hear both of you, thank you. I think now is really a moment where we're at the drawing board and we have the opportunity as Gladys articulated really beautifully to think about not just like what is the pro you know sort of the program in a little p sense of the word but what is the big p program for youth justice what is the model what is our vision and for an expansive view of that vision one at which advocates and family members and young people actually have a seat at decision making tables so that is one change that i would like to see in a meaningful way and i think that that is an innovation that hasn't happened even in a small scale way we have had an acs made progress under the last administration and having community forums and going out to the public there was not however and still remains not really true seats at the table for family members for community for young people and really for the breadth of advocates. I mean, I am privileged personally in that I get to sit on many committees, but one person, no matter how dedicated, is not representative of really what we're talking about, which is the people who are impacted by these policies, which is not me. Um, and so talking about, in particular, scale, you know, close to home has been an important reform in that many young people are now no longer six or seven or eight hours from their family, which is appalling and which was a practice that had to stop. I'd like to point out it hasn't stopped. Young people charged with juvenile offenses are still in secure facilities many, many, many miles from their home. And also, you know, some young people are still um, far away. However, there's been tremendous movement toward having kids 
in residential placements close to home. And also the close to home facilities are generally smaller you know, and more, you know, more home-like. I wouldn't call them homes, but, you know, it is a somewhat less of an institutional model than under the old system um, that the Office of Children and Family Services ran and still runs for some young people. However, the true promise of close to home was not about moving kids from state beds to local beds. Mm. So I'm going to, for example, in 2010, in an article ent entitled Bloomberg Seats Control, Seeks Control of Juvenile Justice System, this was what was reported. The mayor also argued that the average community-based juvenile program in the city, which provides home-based counseling and other social services, costs only about $17,000 per child per year significantly cheaper than the nearly $300,000 the state spends to house a child for a year in a limited secure facility. And there were, that is one of many, many articles in which this vision of moving kids from residential placement into programs, not just because they're cheaper, although that's a nice advantage, but because community-based programs where children are provided the kind of intensive services that address what is happening in their lives and in their family lives have been proven time and time again to have greater success than locking kids up. And that promise has not manifested in large scale. There has been an expansion, and really want to credit the Department of Probation under former Commissioner Schiraldi, and I believe that impetus will continue under um, the new Commissioner, Ana Bermudez, who's wonderful, and credit ACS for expanding some of the slots for alternative to detention and placement. However, as you heard, there are currently about 200 kids in ACS close to home residential placements. That is not a vision of moving kids into alternative to residences. That's local beds mm -hmm. versus state beds. And so I think that the challenge and the opportunity, and it is an opportunity, and there is no one better positioned to manifest this opportunity than Commissioner Carrion um, and then Commissioner Bermudez. And really this amazing leadership we have with Liz Glazer um, in, the, in City Hall and under Mayor de Blasio to really look at what is best for kids and communities. And the last thing I want to say on this point is this. We have to really get honest and real about what the research and facts show us. Because there is this belief that locking kids up, whether it's in detention or jail or on Rikers Island or in docs prisons, whether they're in the adult system or the youth system, right? We are addicted as a society to this idea that when we lock people up, that is a smart crime strategy, right? Thank you. Nice, thank you. That's only like the first point. I'm not even heated yet. <laughs> but thank you. But right, the reality, I have a friend who's a criminologist, a fantastic criminologist, and she says the number one finding in criminology is that incarceration increases crime. It's like the dirty secret of this country. And so just want to give you one example, right? Talk about 16 and 17 year olds on Rikers Island. So, you know, Violence is a real thing, and it's serious, and we have to respond to it seriously. But just in Rikers Island, almost 27% of the youth who are held on Rikers are in solitary. 71% of those youth are diagnosed with a mental illness. The average length of stay for an adolescent in solitary in city jails is 43.1 days. Mm. Okay, so solitary confinement is 23 hour lockdown with your food coming through a slot in the door with no educational programming, no access to school, no human contact, no ability to hug your family member, right? No, so um, when I was a lawyer, I came to this work as a lawyer from legal aid and I was a lawyer for children and child abuse and neglect cases. If a parent locked their child in a room right and put cut a hole through the door and put some gross food through a tray in that hole mm -hmm. and didn't let their kid out to go to school mm -hmm. right and also by the way when they moved them perhaps shackled them and also put them on the balcony for an hour a day including in the cold for their recreation mm -hmm. right let's say there was a small balcony and didn't allow them to make phone calls or speak to anyone, I am certain that the Administration for Children's Services would remove all children from that mine. home. 
right? That child would be removed. All their siblings would be removed whether or not that had happened to them. And the parent would most definitely, I think, be charged in criminal court with a criminal case of child abuse. Because I have seen parents prosecuted for far less than that. For, for example, not seven, sending a 17-year-old to school. I mean, I had a kid who I represented whose mom was charged. The mom would take him to school and the kid would run off the subway. And the mom was charged with educational neglect. But in our city, we are doing this to children who are, the, who are 16 and 17 year olds who, who are under the child abuse statute. Mm. And our taxpayer money is being routinely, while we sit here, there are kids in these conditions right now. Right. So when we talk about sort of what are the next steps, first of all, it's about treating all children as children, regardless of what system they're in, regardless of what they have done, and of really making sure that we're being honest about what we're doing, and we're being honest about the consequences of what we're doing. And if we want to reduce crime, the way to do it is to invest in the kinds of programs programs that have been proven to work, including the trauma-informed approach that Commissioner Carrion spoke about, and not inflicting further trauma on an already traumatized population. All right. So <laughs> Chino, I want to go to you in just one minute, but I want to um, ask Commissioner Carrion to respond to, I mean, there's one element of what you brought up, Gabrielle, that is like sort of underpinning, underlying so much of this and always has. To what degree can you actually bring placement of juveniles in facilities down to zero? I mean, what is the true need for residential placement? I don't think we could ever break it down. I mean, to be honest, as, as Gabrielle said, it's just like child fatalities, right? I mean, my goal is to have zero children die in the city of New York, but it happens. Um, I think that, that we have shrunk the system, will continue to shrink the system. I, I agree with many of the things that Gabrielle said. I mean, the intent is to fashion the program that meets the needs of young people. Um, but I think that, uh, unfortunately, we will always have a need for a small placement uh, facility. Um, young people will commit. Uh, but once again, I mean, it, it is something that I've said forever. We need to be very clear and intentional about who we incarcerate. And they truly, truly must pose a risk to public safety. You know, it, I, I find it challenging to think that Texas, who I don't think anybody thinks is a liberal state, <laughs> right, has managed to pass a law that limits <coughs> entry into their system to only those young people that commit violent felonies, while we continue to incarcerate for nonviolent misdemeanors. Mm. So we need to narrow that front door. And you know, it's a work in progress. And so as we, we talk about what, what we need to do next is we need to continue to narrow that front door. So only those young people that truly pose a risk to public safety would come into a system. And then we need to understand for what length of time and what the right interventions are. What's the right dosage? Because we do harm. Right. We do harm. Okay. Chino Hardin, you, you're working and organizing in these neighborhoods that we're talking about and with the young people we're talking about. And you've been there yourself. What, to what degree is that front door changing or not? What is the status of the relationship between the young people you're working with and the criminal justice system? <coughs> I don't know how much time everybody got. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, um, listen, we can, we can want to reduce, you know, first, uh, Gladys has been a champion for many years and has done tremendous work. <laughs> and I think it's really awesome that you're going to get to kind of oversee your own plan, that's kind of dope. Um, <laughs> but I think if, we, if we're gonna have a conversation about reducing or narrowing the front door, or reducing uh, young people who are in secure detention or residential facilities, then the first conversation we have to do is the front door, which is police contact, right? 
So if you have a young person who lives in a community that, you know, NYPD walks down like it's a paramilitary um, situation in Iraq somewhere, then there's no way uh, young people are not going to have contact. While JRIP um, has, you know, has great numbers and has all of these good philosophies, but at the same time, you know, you have young people who are being overly criminalized for something they've already done the time for, right? When we talk about resources, you know, in 2014, we have to think as, you know, um, adults, you know, who who have so many uh, wealth of resources that the only way to get a young person into opportunities and really develop them is to scare them, is to knock on their door and constantly harass them, have NYPD set up you know, dummy Facebooks who spend so much time befriending them and lying to them, but then turn around and tell that very same young person, tell me the truth. Right? So I don't think that's the example we want to set. And the young people I work with, there is, I mean, we, we talk about relationships between NYPD and young people. There is no relationship between NYPD and young people. There is no trust between NYPD and young people. They are afraid as much as NYPD is afraid of them. Hence is why they shoot first and ask questions later. And yes, I'm going to say some things on this panel that some people might feel a little tense about. And that's okay because my goal and my objective and the work that I do with the Center for New U Leadership is to make sure every young person has the right to self-determine their own destiny. And if that makes people uncomfortable, mm, so well. I don't really care about that. I care about these young people. And the young people I, I work with um, who are in the Arches program, and I want to say one thing about the Department of Probation. As a person who's been on probation myself, I will say um, the Arches program and the NEONS that has been under, uh, you know, that was laid out under uh, Commissioner Sheraldi has been the biggest step in the right direction that probation has ever taken. Um, they're working with the communities, they're um, introducing art programs, and they're working with the community not when the young person has already been locked up and put on probation, but before that happens. Working with not just young people, but also adults. You know, different contracts through Carnegie Hall for arts, um, you know, the Arches program, and so on and so forth. So I said that's a step in the right direction, and I think if we're going to really start to build build a relationship between NYPD and young people and the community, then they can't live in the shadow of what NYPD considers safety because nothing can grow in the shadow. Flowers can't grow in the shadow and neither can our communities and our young people. I actually have, um, you know, not a solution, but a thought. One of the things that some of the young people that we've talked about is how about the 70, um, you know, the 79th and the 81st precinct, which is in our location in Bed-Stuy, actually all the officers come to the Arches program and meet the young people. I think it's a different kind of situation where you can know, um, you know, Sean and Jonathan face to face instead of scaring them. And when I say meet the young people, I'm not talking about like, you know, town hall meetings. I'm talking about come in, come in your regular clothes and introduce yourself and let's build. Let's talk to each other. I think it's before I'm scared of you with a popo, you know, right? Get to know you, right, as NYPD. And before you arrest me and judge me, know me. Know my face. Know where I come from and know it outside of, you know, the NYPD blues, right? And, you know, Gabriella, you said that uh, how you're not impacted. You are. Everybody sitting in this room is impacted because these young people are our future. And these young people are smart. These young people um, are doing tremendous things. I sat in court for 10 hours yesterday with a young man who had to turn himself in and was charged with burglary, right? Even though he didn't steal anything, didn't attempt to steal anything, and we did our best to negotiate that situation with the detectives of the 81st precinct, and still they charged this young man, and the ADAs dropped it down to what we knew it was going to be, which was menacing, which he could have got a desk appearance ticket and went on with his life. But because he was on probation, because he had a criminal record, because he was a brown 
brown young man because he lived in Bed-Stuy. He had to be arrested and then detained for over 18 hours. Even though we had uh, Brooklyn defenders right there advocating for them, even though we were advocating for them, even though a supervisor of the Department of Probation went down and helped him turn himself in, was advocating, this young man still had to be detained for 18 hours, which was something they could have been released on a desk appearance ticket, and that couldn't happen. So install, until we start dealing with the front door of the problem, which is NYPD, I'm sorry, Gladys, that door that you want to narrow will never get narrow because you wouldn't be in detention if you wasn't arrested so powerful chief jaffe the, the there's that on the table now right and i wonder you know the the bigger question ultimately i guess is about culture that has evolved and and practice that has evolved in the city you know in suburban middle class neighborhoods it's sort of standard practice for local police to be at youth centers in plain clothes, getting to know the kids, but they're not dealing with the level necessarily of violent crime that that police in New York are dealing with. So has that? I don't. I'm. I'm not trying to make excuses. I'm just wondering: is there a cultural change that has to take place, or something else? Well, I. I mean. There's so much to respond to that was just said, but obviously the police departments, you know, our number one mission is to protect people and provide public safety. So when kids use guns and shoot people, shoot other people, which may end up shooting four-year-old Morgan, um, what was Morgan's list? Lloyd Morgan in the 4-2 precinct, as it did two summers ago, or any other innocent 13-year-old that was jo just shot in the face by another young person, we have a responsibility uh, to protect the citizens in New York City, and that's our first responsibility. Whether people like how we do it or not, you know, kids don't have a right to run around the streets and, and carry guns and shoot people, whether they're people they don't like or were disrespected by or whether they're innocent bystanders that just happen to be walking by. Now to talk about the police as the front end, I think we got to go a little bit before the police and talk about what happens to kids between before they're born, prenatal care, to like when they're 13 and 14 and walking the streets. The police to me is not the front end. I think that's like a little out there. In terms of programs we provide, so we work with so many programs in this in this city, and I would say to someone who said, "Why didn't you? Why don't the the cops come, or why don't um, the ki the cops come to this organization?" I would say, "Well, how many times have you invited us? Have you ever come and invited us?" I'll tell you what we do do. Okay, we have a summer camp for kids for fourteen hundred kids every summer. All, I would say, majority, minority kids that nobody knows about. Six or seven week summer camp. It's open to all kids. We are actually publicizing it right now. The kids come to ceremonies at the end in August. There are three ceremonies. I sit on the dais and actually cry because they are such unbelievable ceremonies of little kids up until like 16 or 17. We have the Explorer program in the city. It's all law enforcement, 3,000 explorers that have to do with young kids before they ever get involved in crime. We start at a young age. We have junior explorers. Then we go up to explorers, 14 to like 19-year-olds throughout the city, young kids in every precinct, transit, and housing district. So if anybody has kids that want to join a program to be part of a group and feel like you're part of a gang, which really replicates and is you know, part of your family. That's what a gang or a crew is, right? Surrounding yourself to feel love, to feel being loyalty, and to feel like you're being taken care of, you could join the Explorers. We work with a woman named um, Dr. Falani of the All Star Project that works in all over the city, and we sit all the time with kids, and we bring cops in, in jeans, in t-shirts, in small numbers, with youth around the city, and have, and she runs workshops. And we in the police department have been doing that, I want to say, a year or two years, Dave Glassberg, more. We bring out JRIP kids, but it's not only for JRIP, it's for all the kids in the city. She picks the kids, and we go in. And there are sessions set up in advance. There are meetings where we invite kids in housing we did mediation in some of the developments when we saw that um, we had problem 
problemed community relations with the younger people where we had mediation sessions. We just started a basketball league in Brownsville not even a year ago. We wanted to, instead of just deal with kids who've already been involved in, the, in, in criminal conduct, we start a basketball league for eight to 12 year olds. Now for the police department, that's much more, again, resource intensive because you're dealing with younger kids. We needed to hire coaches. We needed to buy their uniforms. We needed to buy 100 basketball. This is not traditionally what the police department does, but we did it. We got money, we got funding, and we did it. We in the 79 precinct a summer ago, we played basketball with the with the people. I shouldn't say guys, sorry, because there were women on the team. In uh, some Sumner, Marcy, and Tompkins, the cops played against the uh, the uh, different young folks in the community in the housing developments and then besides that we brought in a lot of services for young kids and then we had a big barbecue this amazing event and yeah it was one time because I it, it wasn't like we could get all these cops every night to play basketball or you would get all community residents to play basketball but that one event meant something to everyone and lasts for many, many months. And all the events and all the different, we brought McGruff out, we brought a rock wall out. So all the little kids around, there were hundreds of people watching this summer basketball game as I was this past summer. And we do that all over. I'm not talking about one instance. I'm just bringing up different things that we do. So there is a lot the police department does. There's a lot more that we need to do, but there's a lot of other agencies and social service and socioeconomic issues that go on in households that is not the police's responsibility and yet it ends up being the police's responsibility mm -hmm. and that needs to be looked at and addressed also right. it's very easy to be angry at the police department Chris you talked about you worked at Union Settlement for many years so you, you when we were talking you were talking about back the summer of the LA riots and the, the flood of programs that that were put in place that summer in New York. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, building on what Chief Jaffe's just talking about, the, 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 the neighborhood services, I mean, the things that PD is doing are, are very small compared to what could be there from DYCD and so many mm -hmm. other organizations, right? What, what's it like now compared to the heyday of youth services when you were at Union Settlement? So, you know, and it's interesting kind of listening to the different sides, right? And realizing, I think one of the successes, if you think about what's happening in New York, to the degree that we're moving in a different direction, it really is because there is a kind of convergence of thought in, in the scientific world about what works mm -hmm. to stop. And we have to think about, because we're mixing a lot of apples and oranges here, <laughs> what kids are we most concerned about mm -hmm. related to law enforcement and communities? And by and large, it's around violent behavior. Mm -hmm. That is a very small number, even in a community like Harlem, mm -hmm. of the young people in our communities. So on one level, we need to stop our government systems, particularly our, our police and correction systems, from treating all young people mm -hmm like they're that very small minority. And that's, I think, where the commissioner is, is moving the department that I think is very important. The, 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 you know, the 1% the or 5% of kids <laughs> that we are most concerned about, mm -hmm. we actually can do a lot to stop violent behavior amongst those young people. And some of that has already happened. The other kids we need to think about <laughs> are the kids that we generally don't pay a lot of attention to because they're, they wake up every morning trying to be good and great, going to school, walking around the, the, the drug dealers, walking, some, in some cases walking around the police because they're afraid, as one 10-year-old girl told me, I'm afraid of the police when I see them, mm. you know? And we have to think about what we're, you know, doing for those young people. And so a couple of things occurred to me. One of the things is we've gotten a lot smarter at assessing risk in the, the justice system, in the child welfare system. Now, for most citizens of the city, you, you hear risk assessment, your eyes may gloss over, right? But it's actually uh, uh, something that I think is very important for the kids that we're talking about. We need to be able to suss out when a young person is engaged by the police, probation, the child welfare system, what's really happening in their lives. 
and where can government have an impact? And, and quite frankly, government's not the only story here. Uh, we also know that there are some things that we can do for kids who have mental uh, health issues, uh, who have what we call criminal thinking. <laughs> there are actually programs that we can deploy that are fairly cost-effective, mm -hmm. brief in their intervention to help address those issues. The problem is that our correction system is a, a set up to keep people problem free. But in communities, you're also concerned about people being fully prepared to be citizens and to participate in kind of the democratic life in their community. So my, my story about Union Settlement is interesting because when the LA riots happened, I, I was running a summer youth program in a community center at Union Settlement in East Harlem, and there were all these calls from the city. What do you need? <laughs> Now, meanwhile, you know, we're running programs every day. We had the TV on, kids were watching the, what was going on and the, the riots and rebellion, whatever you want to call it. And the Congress pushed through $1.4 billion in money that included summer youth money. That summer, I was able to hire, we had a summer youth program, serving about 300 kids, over 1,000 kids. They said, hire as many kids as you need. So. Those kinds of responses are interesting. So for me, I was, it was great. I was going on the street corner and pulling kids, come and get a job, right? <laughs> we had kids want to be entrepreneurs, want to start their record label, great. I, I, I got 10 of them and, and hired them, and they you know, did their records and laid tracks and did the whole thing at the center. It was beautiful. I have no idea if that investment actually paid off, right? Because what we tend to do is have ideological battles about things. And then mm -hmm. when people get concerned about safety, we overreact. Mm -hmm. And so the overreaction often is through using our law enforcement and correction system in neighborhoods like Harlem or Bed-Stuy, where I live. Mm -hmm. But also on the left side of things, we tend to overreact too, thinking that money is a cure-all for you know, what ails our communities. We know in Harlem that what has happened in part to the community is that the frequent interventions by the correction system, the, the different welfare systems, all the alphabet soup, has weakened the collective efficacy in those communities. There are longtime residents, even of some of the, the tough public housing developments like the Polo Ground, they will tell you about times where the community worked to address young people, and they worked with their police officers because they knew that who they were. That was what one woman told me. We used to know the names of the cops mm -hmm. and stuff. So I think we're moving to a better place where we're really, again, thanks to advocates like Chino, the, the work of the Juvenile Justice Project, um, we are now recognizing how policy and practice affects communities, right? Mm -hmm. So the secret is out. No more <laughs> of this kind of machine thinking about policy. It's mm -hmm. all bottom up. It's all going to be about transparency. Yeah. The police are not going to be able to labor in the dark, people not knowing what they do. And the procedural justice literature is actually pointing us towards this idea that fair treatment, respectful treatment, increases legitimacy of mm -hmm. the law and of the agencies that are, are, are you know, approved by citizens to enforce the law. And that's very important. That's important for courts, for prosecutors, for police, that we begin to be procedurally fair with the folks that we're serving. Because right. if folks feel the law is legitimate, they're more likely to obey it. Even the kids, my Justice Corps kids, these are some hardcore cats. They're 18 to 24. Some of them came out of Gladys's former agency onto adult parole, right? And the city in, is trying to do something different with them. These kids are not convinced. We, we had one of our, our uh, Lieutenant Marabella from Chief Jaffe's come to talk to them. And the immediate response is like, wait, the cops. <laughs> mm -hmm. After the presentation, a bunch of them go up to him. No, cop has never talked to us. We've never known a police officer. We've never had a cop come and offer to, to help us. That, that kind of stuff t is, is going to happen more and more because the agencies of government are gonna have to change, we're gonna have to change the way we do business, led by the science, led by what's right. What's the right way, as police commissioner Brandt says, constitutional policing. We need better treatment you know, in the organizations. And I'll put a plug in also for the fact that in our agencies, 
in our courts and our prosecutors, our child welfare agencies, we also need to treat the people who are doing this work uh, mm -hmm. better because yeah. they're having a tough, uh, a tough time. All right. We're going to um, ask for questions in just a sec. So if you have a question, please put up your hand and somebody will come around with a mic. I'm going to ask one more while they're doing that. Um, Chino, you talked about the work of Arches. The, the, the need for small organizations, what, the, the, the term that, that Chris mentioned was collective e efficacy of neighborhoods. I mean, it's sort of the formal and the informal ability of neighborhoods to do things for themselves. Some of that comes from small organizations. What are the challenges you're seeing working with a small organization to work to getting city money to make things happen? <clears throat> I think one of the challenges, I'll speak specifically to the um, Arches. Arches is a, a great program under the Young Men's Initiative um, that works with young people ages 16 to 24 who are on probation. It's a mentoring program, right? Um, when you're a small organization and you submit a proposal and actually get a contract, and let's say the contract is $250,000 and you're like, yes, I'm going to be able to do these things with the young people, have mentors, great stuff, right? Until you read the fine print of the contract, it's a reimbursement contract. So unless you got $250,000, you don't have, you can have it in the bank, but unless you got that money in the bank and it's not allocated for anything, how are you gonna do that, right? So it still is gonna be a piecemeal. So you can have a $250,000 grant, right? And only spend $150,000 because that's the only money you have and then lose the rest of that money because it doesn't roll over, right. right? So you can't even spend the 250000 for example, because you don't have the 250000 So I think, you know, while the idea is awesome, but I think there's a, a hint of setup to failure if you're going to grant small organizations, and they went in with the front door understanding these are going to be some with grass top, but there's some of them was going to be small organizations with credible messengers. So they went in knowing that was going to happen, but no, I mean, there was some provisions in terms of you know um, advances and things like that, but not to a point where it actually gets the program to where it needs to be. So the contract that we have, right, is through uh, another organization called Friends of Bedford, who has been you know very involved and has been very helpful and dedicated to making sure that we have the funds to fulfill this contract and provide these services, but if not for my other organization, the Center for New Leadership, when I say things would have not been met. I've had my, I've been lucky enough to have mentors who have been dedicated and have went two months without receiving a paycheck right. to make sure that these young people receive these services. So I think things like that, um, you know, is a barrier to, to actually being really progressive in providing the services, and more so than just services, but what we're really, pro we're not working on issues, we're working on people, right? So what we're providing outside of interactive journalism is a compass to for these young people to take when they leave to help navigate them to true human development, right? And we're not talking about just, you know, stay out of trouble. No, that's not the, the main focus. That is a focus. It's not the main focus. What we're talking about here is real education alongside of academic education, right? So you could go to high school, go on to college, graduate degree, become a lawyer, become a doctor, everything else, and still be one of the dumbest people in the room, right? So, I mean, I know so many dumb people that went to Ivy League schools, right? But that's another conversation. So, I mean, young people having the political analysis and education to understand why things are the way they are in their neighborhoods, right? right. Uh, we met with an organization not too long ago. Um, it's an arts organization, and, and they showed us some murals, right? And one of them says, don't move, improve. And that's kind of the, the method and ideology that we want to help instill in our young people, right? It's not about making it out of the ghetto, right? It's about making the ghetto a community and not just a neighborhood. It's about like bringing true power back to our people. It's about like being a part of the solution and not thinking just because you're not a part of the problem anymore that your job is done. Right. So these, but it's interesting that these technical things can be the biggest challenge or and not the biggest challenge, but a big challenge to achieving the vision. Who's got the microphones? Hello. Um, my first question is to whoever wants to answer, actually. 
Um, so in an ideal world, the Civilian Complaint Review Board mm -hmm. can serve as an intermediary um, between the police and the community. In the real world, practitioners and youth alike kind of scoff at that um, because it doesn't really exist. So my question is, how can the NYPD and what responsibility do they have um, to leveraging the CCRB as a resource to truly improving the culture um, at, of New York City and improving police community relations? Um, right now, I believe that uh, actually um, it was just spoken about a couple of days ago. I think the whole process of the CCRB review board is being looked at and examined like right now because I heard about it just two days ago um, to look at how they mediate, how calls are called in, and it's being reexamined right now. So I would just say it's an opportunity in the department that Commissioner Branton has taken upon and the people that are involved in the process and the examination and the analysis of it, it it's happening as we speak. And I think we'll, I, I can't say what the outcome is going to be, but I, I'm sure it's going to be done in such a way that's going to be more effective for both the communities um, that we serve and for, you know, law enforcement. Keep those mics moving. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, say that uh, after close to 40 years in this, in this field, this is an incredibly hearten, uh, heartening uh, kind of uh, thing to hear. I mean, it's really a, a wonderful. Um, uh, I think that, first of all, Civilian Complaint Review Board, I was a mediator there on the board for a number of years. There are some dramatic, wonderful outcomes from that, and it has been blocked as a viable entity for forever. And I think that kind of restorative relationship process is really critical. The crisis really makes that um, uh, a possibility, more than a possibility, really a, uh, a really powerful I interchange. Uh, building on what Chino said, um, to me also, um, in my experience, I've really come to believe that integrating meaning and value into every program mm. so that the, the youth, as they're engaged, also um, identify not only what's meaningful for them, and believe me, meaningful for them automatically means getting into the economic system, but also, in addition, what to do something with meaning so as to be part of the community, mm -hmm. whether it's doing a documentary about your community or in some way. Right. Um, and I wanted to know to what extent that is integrated in any of these programs, because most of them are just purely family-related, social work-based, and uh, um, I think th there's a missing piece. Can I, can I speak to that uh, briefly? So that's Mark Kleiman and Community Mediation Services. They do great work uh, out, out in Queens. Um, what, so one of the things I love about the New York City Justice Corps initiative is that the core members design, scope, and develop community benefit projects that they implement and that the core funds. They go out to community organizations, sometimes to churches that have a social mission, whether it's a soup kitchen or a clothing bank, and they do things in those organizations, like the National Black Theater, you know, putting up, uh, you know, helping them to spruce up the theater, creating a changing room, you know, for them. That, so, what's interesting about that is that when the young people, and it's a jobs program, essentially, job and education program, but those community benefit projects are absolutely critical. That's the moment where they feel mm -hmm. as a, like they're a resource for their community. They went, they designed a project. In three weeks, they go from coming into the program and then standing before the community advisory board to get their project approved, presenting the budget, presenting mm -hmm. pictures of what they want to do, and the whole team comes out and makes that presentation. Mm -hmm. And that's an example, I think, of, Mark, where you were going, this idea of we, we know that these young people, you know, there's a real, there's meaning to their lives, right, beyond the worst thing that they ever did. And giving them an opportunity to do that, you just see an incredible change. Some of the young people in this program have been young people who were on opposite crews, who may have even been shooting at each other at one point, 
but they come together and work together on these projects. And that's a value added for Harlem uh, and the other communities where this program is, is operating. And I'd like to see more integration of those kinds of approaches in some of the, the programs that we do, where the young people are a resource, not just recipients of service, that they actually have voice, something to say, and, and something that they can do and give. Hi, uh, thank you so much uh, for speaking this morning. I was just wondering, um, we've been talking a lot about programs, and I think we could probably agree that we um, would need less of them if we had sounder policy, particularly if it was um, informed by those that are most affected. So I'm wondering, um, we talked a little bit about Youth Voice, but if Mayor de Blasio was here today, how would you recommend that he incorporate Youth Voice, building um, Youth Voice at the neighborhood level through these outreach programs you're talking about? And um, you know, what, what should he do now to ensure that we have the leaders for tomorrow? Nice. Well, um, it's funny, I, I met uh, Mayor de Blasio maybe a couple of weeks before he became mayor. So I, I took my time to get my photo op in while I was early. <laughs> um, so I, I think uh, some of the things I would, I would recommend continuing Young Men's Initiative, um, specifically the Arches program, I would recommend changing the way it's structured in terms of how funds are dispensed. I would actually recommend um, See, the Arches program is for young people ages 16 to 24 who are on probation. I would actually take some of that model and change it a little bit and recommend it for all young people in these communities out of the neon, um, you know, uh, neighborhood centers. So that's what I, that's one of the things I, I would recommend. And I just want to touch on one thing. So while we are working with these young people <clears throat> through the Neon's Arts Project and getting involved in the play that we're doing called What It Is, which is a parody off of The, the Wiz, um, we haven't got to the stages where you were just talking about, but what we have been able to do, there's a couple of things that happened in Brooklyn recently that's in the news that folks were murdered and things like that, and I got a couple of young people who uh, lost some folks um, in, in those incidents, and um, you know, we're, we're working with them to not retaliate, and that has been instrumental. As far as I know, sitting right now, they haven't retaliated, right? And then we've had incidences with young people. Uh, a, a young man uh, had an incident with one of our mentors, and he had a weapon in his possession and was going to stab him. And we was able to talk him off the ledge, and now they sit and build and talk to each other organically. And while y'all might be like, whoa, that is a win for us, right? This young man was real enough to say, yeah, I got that, I was about to pop him in the neck, you know? And I was able to use my credible messengering, right? <laughs> to um, talk him off the ledge. And just like you, we have Bloods and Crips and all our little small little neighborhood crews. And then we have had no incidents of real violence, right? And no incidents of retaliation in terms of things that have happened. Matter of fact, at the Center for New Leadership, we've held Crip, Gang, and Latin King meetings in our, our, um, our space, and we live in a blood neighborhood, right? And we've had Latin Kings be able to come through and walk through and meet and talk about the problems within their nation without any kind of like retaliation, any situations from blood. So those things we consider wins, while those things you can't, you can't put in, you know, uh, report to the foundation right. that uh, you know nobody ain't get stabbed today. So <laughs> gonna be a good day. Yeah, it's, it's a, a good, good day, day. <laughs> with a check at. You know what I'm saying? So those are the things we can't necessarily already talk about. But to speak to your question, I would I would totally do that with the arches, and I will also make sure this is an ongoing thing that's in the budget forever. Right. right? That it's not just you know three years because that's what the contract is, and then it disappears like so many programs do. Yeah, there are a lot of projects around youth voice in many city agencies. The question is, how do you actually incorporate it in some truly meaningful way in policy? I hate to say it, but we've just run out of time for more questions. Um, but I did want to give everybody on the panel just chance to say just a couple of sentences more about where you think we can get just in the next year, like short term, can there be, do you see one or two real clear opportunities for progress right now and keep this very tight? Commissioner Carrion. So absolutely, and the chief reminded me, I'm running out of here uh, for the first meeting of the mayor's children's cabinet. 
um, which really is a vehicle to bring all city agencies together to better align and coordinate our investments and working together. And I think that that could be really powerful in neighborhoods um, if we're working together if we're and, and really um, doing initiatives uh, together to really address some of the systemic problems that we have in neighborhoods. And I, and I got to say that, that um, the front door for me really is the issue of the inequity and poverty in communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's where we need to really start mm -hmm. yes. uh, and looking at those conditions um, that create uh, uh, the under-resource and, and the disparity that really create the conditions that allow for the violence um, in our communities and for young people to make um, to see, I mean, to be as hopeless as they are in so many instances. So we we need to really look uh, in all my systems that I run. You know, juvenile justice, child welfare, and child care. Um, the families that we serve are the poorest um, families, and the issues really arise out of poverty in many many instances. And so we need to really deal with those root causes. Right. Just um, from a police department perspective, really look at. Um, how we can not just re-energize and reset, but what we do and how to make it more effective in policing the communities and doing it with the communities as true partners, um, working with them, sitting with them, going out where the people uh, where we police know who we are, know what our role is, and we know what they want from us. Mm -hmm. So working to be more efficient in doing that, and also um, exactly what the commissioner just said, I think as city agencies, there's a real hole there and we need to work better together. So if ACS is looking at some families and Department of Education is looking at some families and there's foster care families and then the police department is looking at families, like why aren't we all doing this together in a cohesive fashion and coming up with a plan, a long-term plan, short-term plan to address what some of the inequities or some of the problems are in these families and not wait till they get out of control where they turn into just pure law enforcement issues and then affect everybody else. Great. Thanks, yeah. Andrew. So I'm going to use two brief analogies for my two opportunities. And this is the first one. So if you've heard me speak, you might have heard me say this, I'll stop telling this story when the system changes. That's kind of how I see it. So a long time ago when we had coal mining, right, uh, people know about the canary in a coal mine, that m miners would bring canaries down into the coal mine and the canaries are very sensitive their lungs are very sensitive and they would get ill before the coal miners do and so when the canary died or the canary got very sick it was a signal to the coal miners to get out of the mine because they were next I think children are coal mines and our canaries children are acutely sensitive to what happens around them children are dependent on adults in a way that adults are not dependent on each other. I mean, we're all interdependent, but children are uniquely dependent on adults, and they are uniquely dependent on society. And where children are distressed, whether that distress is manifesting as violence, whether it's manifesting as not paying attention in school, whether it's manifesting as rolling their eyes in a judge, something is going on. So tie right? that into... So, Kind what I think what we want to have what we want to do is we want to that's well you know I only had one question so <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> so I think what we want to do right is we want to shift and it's not achievable in one year but it is achievable through a series of policy changes that have at their essence a different way of looking at children which is not criminalizing them because what we do right now is we shoot the canary Mm. and we put it in handcuffs. Mm. That is not the answer. The answer is looking at the mind. Mm. And the answer is saying, how are we as adults accountable for the conditions in our society that Commissioner Carrion spoke about? And so it's about shifting the program model so that kids are not criminals and we're figuring out what's going on and we target our programs to improve what's happening inside our collective society. That's number one. Number two. <laughs> Right, is about also really, and this has been an undercurrent throughout this conversation, but we didn't discuss head on what can be done, is like 
racial and ethnic and class disparities that undergird policing and the youth justice system, right? So when I said I wasn't impacted, I don't mean I'm not impacted by policies. What I mean is that when I was in high school as a white kid of two school teachers and I was engaging in delinquent acts, which I was, I didn't go to the OCFS system for doing those things. But I had a bed for you. I'm sure you did. <laughs> And you would have loved me, Gladys, because I would have been organizing the whole system and all the other kids would have been like in a union, okay? But, but just to give one brief statistic, Harry Levine, who's a researcher, found using New York criminal court data the following breakdown with regard to summonses for riding bikes on sidewalks mm. between 2008 and 2011. In Park Slope, where I live, eight. In Red Hook and Carroll Gardens in Brooklyn, six. In bed 2,050. In Brownsville, 1,062, and in East New York, 1,004. How come some kids get to ride their bikes on the sidewalk and other kids don't? How come some kids have access to parks and other kids don't? So how come some kids, right, when they get caught riding their bike, whether it's on a sidewalk or on a path going the wrong way inside the park, we think that's a kid being a kid, and that's what kids do. And when other kids do that, they get a summons, which if they don't answer, turns into a warrant, which they can then be arrested for, which then can set off a whole series of criminal court interventions or juvenile court interventions at great taxpayer cost. And so what do we do with that? Because Andrew's about to ask me that. What we oh. do with that, right? <laughs> is I think we also take a really hard, clear-eyed look at the data and what we're doing at a granular level. We, and we look at racial and class and neighborhood-based disparities, and we start coming up with policies that aren't just, because I just read, for example, that the Brooklyn DA's office, and this is awesome, right, is coming up with a diversion program for 16 and 17-year-olds who are arrested for aggressively riding their bikes on sidewalks. That's what it said in the New York Times. And on one hand, right, that's an improvement. On the other hand, like, do we need a... A program for that? <laughs> All right. But I hear you. I mean, those stats are incredibly telling. Yeah. Um, so, you. you know, the new stop and frisk is summonses, and that's the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got arrested for flicking a cigarette on the floor. No, seriously. I flicked a cigarette on the floor. The cops had to come here, and I, I was automatically like, whoa. So it's about to flex my know your rights, because this is what I do, right? And he was all the way upset that I was challenging him. And I said, you know what, officer, you're right. I shouldn't have put that on the floor. I picked it up and put it in the trash. If it was really about littering, like he said it was, then the conversation should have been over, right? I don't even know if it was my cigarette butt, but I picked one up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it should have been over. No, I got arrested. And the charge with obstruction of justice because I didn't want to give him my ID. And I had to go sit through the system. They dropped the charges, but the point is, is that if I didn't work at the Center for New Leadership, I wouldn't have no job. You know what I'm saying? Because I work there. I ain't gonna be in my lunch break, I'll be back tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? So I said it to say that those stats that Gabrielle gave are the truth. Young people are being summoned for spitting and all of these other things. And you know what? The bread and butter of New York City cannot be off the backs of our young people. And that's just the case. And it's true, it's racially motivated. My I wanna I want my kids to be able to ride the bike on the sidewalk and if Cops say something, we're like, hey, we can't have you on the sidewalk. And it'd be that. When I was a young person, that was the case. But I'm going to respect the time, and I want to say two things. One, <laughs> <laughs> just two. two they're, re short. they're really quick. One, Gotta give Chris a we can't be talking about, <laughs> if your starting point is criminal justice, then there will never be no justice. What we're really talking about is human justice. And human rights plus human development equals human justice. And the last thing is, because I'm Native American, I want to leave you with a, a quote. They say, we do not inherit the earth from our parents, but we borrow it from our children. And if that's the case, and we want to have an earth and a community and a city around in 50, 60, 70 years, then we have to invest in all young people and not just in the ones who happen not to be brown and black, because that's the disparity that's happening. When it comes to brown and black young people, they're, they're looked at as disposable, they're looked at automatically as criminal, and at the end of the day, a child is a child no no matter what color that child is. All right. Chris? So, yeah, I won't, uh, I'll be very quick. I think the changes in the police department are gonna open up opportunities for precinct-based diversion. 
where you're not even having kids go into you know probation assessments or the, and I think there are opportunities there and that the city should foster um, and the state you know foster those opportunities for cops in communities who know kids to be working with the social workers the parents the teachers the people at the ground level and be great to see diversion centers created in communities that officers could have as an option uh, to to an arrest yeah options matter all right. Thank you all so much for coming. And thanks to the panel.